And now um, I will give you a brief overview of the webinar before I hand it over to our moderator for the day. So today we are talking ab about global citizen citizenship education and we'll focus on the council's work in this area. So we'll have uh, four, four of the councils presenting their work and then we ha we'll have a Q&A session at the end. You may use the Q&A function that you can see there to address any que questions to the speakers that you might have. And um, now that we've done all the housekeeping stuff, I am sure we are ready to hear from the speakers today. But before that, I am delighted to introduce our moderator for the day, and that's Delaney Ryan. Delaney is a cultural worker, a writer and artist living in Chibuktu, that is Halifax. She holds a BFA from Concordia University and received an MA in art history from Queen's University. Delaney has worked for the Canadian Museum of, of Immigration at Pier 21 and is a board member for the arts uh, nonprofit Youth Art Connection. Uh, we'll put the, the links to the Canadian Museum of Immigration and the Youth Art Connection uh, in the chat, just in case you're interested in checking them out. And now uh, I will pass it over to Delaney to um, take it over. Wonderful. Thank you, Juliana, for that introduction. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today to moderate what I'm sure is going to be a really inspiring discussion of some of the amazing experiences in global citizenship education initiatives that are coming out of Canada right now. Um, I will introduce each panelist in more detail as we go, um, but I would like to begin by thanking each of our wonderful panelists for taking this time out to share their work with us today. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jackie Dowling of the ACIC, Nancy Burrow of AQOCI, uh, James Cornelson of MCIC, and White, uh, sorry, Wajd uh, El Habibi uh, of ACGC. Um, so today we'll be beginning with Jackie Dowling, who is a program manager at the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation, who will be illuminating some methodology to get us started. So Jackie has been working in the areas of community development, social justice, uh, and youth engagement for the last 20 years nationally and internationally. Uh, at ACIC, Jackie works in program development and the implementation of youth programming at the local level, so with ACIC members member organizations and non-member community groups, uh, as well as at the national and international level um, with other council members, nonprofits, and government offices. And drawing on her experience to date, Jackie is um, currently a uh, master's candidate for the adult ed in women's leadership and community development at St. Francis Xavier, Nova Scotia. So uh, again, thank you very much for taking uh, some time out of what I'm sure is a pretty busy life that you're leading right now. Um, but today uh, we'll we'll start off with you, and um, so congrats and, and thanks for for getting us started. There we go. I'm just gonna get everything shared here. One second. There, perfect. Um, thanks so much. So I would like to start uh, by first saying thank you to Delaney for getting us, guiding us through this today. And as well, thank you to Judy and Matteo um, for putting all the work in for this. It's definitely been bits here and there beside, behind the scenes. So thanks for that. And thanks to folks from the other councils for joining us today. It's always nice to learn from each other in these moments. Um, and as well, before I go on, I'd like to do, I guess, my own little acknowledgement, land acknowledgement. I'm connecting from Mi'kmaqi, which is, uh, was mentioned, it's the unceded, unsurrendered ancestral uh, territory of the, of the Mi'kmaq. Um, and for me personally, I'm connecting from my home community of Shubenacadie, uh, which is very close to Sabagnagadie uh, First Nation, Mi'kmaq First Nation, and the home, uh, home I guess, uh, of the Shubenacadie Residential School. I like to mention that myself because I think growing up in a community where, um, you know, just every day there was this reminder, you know, I can remember um, way back when, when the residential school burned, like the whole community was out. And I think um, these kind of like 
key memories and moments and, and community experience um, growing up have led me to a point where so much of my learning and unlearning um, has come from some of that influence and um, kind of really gives me this um, belief in the, the local pieces <laughs> as well as the global pieces of global citizenship um, education. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. Um, a little bit about ACIC, I don't want to go too much into this, um, but our vision is, uh, is to connect a, Atlantic Canadians engaged as global citizens to create a just world. The mission, um, as is similar to most of the other councils, I think is uh, ACIC is a coalition of individuals, organizations, institutions working in the Atlantic region. region. Uh, we're committed to achieving global sustainability in a peaceful and healthy environment with just practices. Um, yeah, so you can read a little bit more of that mission there. I've been with ACIIC on and off for about eight years now. Uh, I had a little stint uh, for parental leave and and whatnot, and I'm, I'm still here and really loving my work with ACIC, which is always a bonus. Um, a little bit about the youth side of, of ACIC's work. We have some really wonderful programs, but I'll be focusing today on our youth programs. Um, we have a Global Citizenship Youth Conference that we host annually for youth ages 15 to 17. We have a community of practice, um, which is for sort of post-secondary university um, aspiring professionals in communities, um, which brings them together to learn some of the like tips, tricks, and trends of entering into um, fields of social justice and international cooperation. Uh, we are currently coming to the end of a five-year program, uh, International Internships for Indigenous Youth, which I believe there was uh, just shy, very shy of 100 youth um, doing internships um, overseas with Southern Partners and virtually due to pandemic realities, which I'm sure we are all aware of. Um, we are in our third year now of running a photo voice program, which connects Atlantic Canadian youth uh, to um, youth from Southern Partner countries. Um, uh, and they document their experiences in community through photos. Uh, we offer workshops on global citizenship, SDGs, whatever it is folks in the community might come to us for. Um, we also have uh, youth funding, youth events uh, connected to International Development Week. We have our global citizenship program, a uh, certificate, sorry, um, which is a, a, a program that focuses on um, engaging youth age 15 to 17. There's three um, three knowledge modules and two action modules. Uh, it's over the span of about six months. Um, and we're really committed to summer students supporting internship programs. Um, for young folks in our communities and in the region who are interested in gaining some work experience. Um, when I was thinking about what I was going to touch on today, I was right in the midst of doing a bunch of promotion for our, our um, Global Citizenship Conference, which will be coming up in July. And in the promotion, we actually have these four points, create, connect, change, and challenge. And when I was thinking about our, our Global Citizenship Education work that we do, these four words kind of kept sticking out to me as I see them as common threads that weave throughout our, our various youth programs. Um, and while I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on our youth programs today, I kind of, I didn't want to give too much of a go in too deep to them because what I really wanted to touch on was some of the methods that we use in our in our youth programs that we have found um, to kind of lead to some successful um, longer term effective change um, that have helped us kind of like get to where we are today in terms of our youth programs and that help keep us current and relevant in terms of switching up our youth programs when, when need be um, to respond to what the youth of the the various the, the needs of our various youth are so as I go through I'm going to focus on these four sort of words of create connect change and challenge um, so for the first piece I guess some of the the things that we have found over the years that have really contributed to 
our, our global citizenship education programs for youth are that we're, we really work with youth to more and more, we're working with youth to do these programs that are created by youth for youth. I know Delaney mentioned in, in the intro, in my intro there that I'm, I'm doing a master's program right now. And I'm really lucky because it's kind of connected to this for youth by youth work. So it's really interesting for me to see the connections and to be able to connect my personal, um, sorry, professional and academic um, sort of like worlds at the moment. Um, a really wonderful example of where we've been able to do this is um, about a year and a half ago, we had a youth advisory committee that could, that was comprised of eight youth from all four regions and all four provinces in the Atlantic. And those youth really helped influence our programs. And they actually completely created our global citizenship certificate program. So more and more, we're finding that bringing youth in, working with our summer students with our interns who are who are from that youth demographic um, doing these focus groups having youth advisory councils and having them create the programs that we are then we are then delivering to youth is bringing about more engagement in our youth programs um, and then it's it's wonderful for them, you know, they they finish a program and it's something so solid and concrete that they can put on a resume and use, you know, as they navigate their their budding professional careers or whatnot to to say that they created a youth program. Um, so we find doing more and more work around for youth by youth um, is really a beneficial beneficial practice. Um, something we've been working on for quite a while now is having programs that youth graduate through. Um, so we've been really intentional in creating creating programs where youth can start out in that younger age of 14, 15, and sort of graduate through the programs if they're interested in doing that. Um, all of our programs are standalone. You don't need to do one to do another, um, but we are finding more and more it's a way for us to develop deeper connections with youth. Um, we have one youth who currently in this last year we've been working with quite a bit, and he started as a youth, a youth ambassador in 2015 so you know eight years ago or so he was a youth ambassador in one of our programs and since then has moved from the youth ambassador program to the youth advisory council helped created the global citizenship program has then gone on to to be a subject matter expert and has spoken on panels for us many times um he's in he just graduated from law school and then this last winter actually attended the um Oh my gosh, the CW, C, CSW uh, in New York as, as part of the ICN youth delegation. So we also have stories of, of sisters. You know, we have three sisters that we love who always keep coming back to us. And, and one started as a youth ambassador, then attended the conference, then kept going on um, and doing this work. They've been youth leaders. They sit on our panels. So we find that having programs that youth can, can start with in terms of like a conference, which is an interest and an intro, go a little bit deeper into a certificate program, learn more, then come out and be leaders at our conference or sit on panels for us, be part of our internship programs, um, is something that has really contributed to some, some positive global citizenship uh, engagement in terms of education. Um, we also create programs around the SDGs. I'm sure most councils do at this point, um, but I just want to acknowledge that we find it a really great way to create programs that can focus on the, the interests of youth. Um, because because they're so vast in terms of there being 17, we're able to create programs where the youth can say, I'm interested in number four, I'm interested in five or 11. And then their focus and programs can be on the specific SDG that they're interested in. Um, and or we also use the SDGs in terms of, of um, we just recently finished a photo voice program that had a gender theme. Um, so all of the 10 weeks of the photo voice program looked at different um, SDGs through the lens of gender. Um, so so it's a really great way for us to keep developing programs that respond to the needs of youth. Um, just a quick slide with our global citizenship uh, certificate there, which I already mentioned. Um, connecting. So I think an important part of, of some of the work that we do is this connecting piece. So the three words that kind of resonated with me here were representation, intergenerational, and partners. Um, one of the challenges for ACIC is that we are a regional council. So we do work in, in four provinces, uh, the Atlantic provinces, so Newfoundland, PEI, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. So in terms 
terms of representations, that's one of the first places that we start is that we are always looking for ways to ensure that we are representing all four regions and not just um, the capitals of each region or the bigger communities in each region. Um, you know, we have a strong partnership with the Nazi of the government and every year for about, um, I'd say eight or nine years now, we have anywhere from three to five youth, uh, Inuit youth from the coast of Labrador who are really actively engaged in our program. And it's almost sort of taken on a little bit of life of its own where now we've got a sister recommending a sister and, and coming in and doing our program. So representation in terms of like region and where we are and ensuring that we're incorporating um, the youth in our communities for more isolated um, rural communities, as well as um, when we build our programs, we like to ensure that we have youth leadership at program at let's say our conference, for example, um, that the youth leadership reflects the youth who are attending the conference. Um, so very, you know, we often will kind of wait a little bit, it might be a bit last minute, but it's really important to us to take a look at who's attending our conference, let's say, of the 50 youth that are attending, ensure that we and ensure that we have leaders that represent their various identities in so many ways. Um, so I would say representation, representation is a piece, intergenerational. Um, again, go back to our conference and it's really key um, to ensure that the facilitators who are there, um, the elders that we bring in, the community representation comes from a whole range of, of ages and that intergenerational piece is always key. Um, we try really hard with our, our internships and our summer placement to provide mentorship opportunities. So that might not necessarily be ACIC staff. It could be connecting the students, uh, the youth who work with us to members who, who may have nice alignment with like potential careers that youth are going into. Um, so that's a piece that we work really hard to ensure that youth who come to work with us can leave having their the needs of ACIC met and their own personal needs in terms of like finding programs that they are really interested in and working with those. Um, the connect piece, I think it's also really important to mention partners. Um, our photo voice program is a wonderful example where um, for 10 weeks, you know, we just finished a program um, with the McBrister Foundation in Nigeria and the Girls Empowerment Network, Network in Malawi, connecting 30 youth, 10 from at the Atlantic region here, 10 from Nigeria, 10 from um, Malawi. And each week we had um, different speakers and subject matter experts from all three countries to ensure that the voice that all youth are hearing um, comes kind of that representation piece. So I would say ensuring that when we think of our programs that we take that connection part um, and who we're connecting with and be very intentional about that is also key. Um, just a quick screenshot of our, our photo voice galleries, which uh, we have two new galleries that will be live very soon. So make sure you follow us on social media to, to have a, a quick look at our photo voice galleries. Um, change uh, is another sort of thread that I think of often. Um, who are the experts? You know, we've, we've really, I think there's like a, a larger sort of like, um, trend in, you know, in various fields to really be thinking of like what experience is valued and who are the experts that we're incorporating into our programs. Um, so with that, we've been really intentional over the last few years to start including youth voices, not just into our global citizenship education, but into our, like for youth, but into our membership um, programs that we do to all the panels that we do so that we are looking at youth as subject matter experts. Um, um, and not necessarily just valuing um, anyone with academic experience, but looking at lived experience, academic experience. There's so much in terms of, of what experience is um, and folks who need to be, to, their voices need to be heard. Um, so really sort of like when we think of change and we think of the programs that we're doing, one way that we see being able to affect, affect change is being intentional with the voices that we're, we're, um, we're highlighting and, and putting forward. Um, and I would say we also are really intentional too with, uh, let's say our, our global citizenship certificate, you know, these modules um, that are run, the facilitators who come in are, are young folks as well. We've really heard from, from our younger audience that seeing a like people who reflect their their age and their identities is key to them. So we are, are responding in that way as well. Um, 
I think in all of our programs, I, I know it's a bit of like a reflection tool or an evaluation tool, but the what, so what, now what really comes into how we talk about change in our youth programs and our global citizenship programs. So, you know, this is sort of like, what have we learned? What does that mean now? What do we do with it? Um, really using that as a bit of a thread to help affect change, to shift perspectives. Um, and then I'm going to get to the last one here. I feel like I'm coming up on 10 minutes. So somebody feel free to let me know if I'm, I'm getting close. Um, uh, just talking about challenge. I think, you know, it's, I, it challenges the place where like, you know, it's important for us as a team to look at ourselves, to look at our programs, to not, you know, I, I sort of look at youth work, global citizenship education, the education work that we do. I, I hold all of like the programming really lightly because it's not, you know, it can it can be really personal. You can get attached to something and, and you can think like, I want this program to keep going or to be this, or I put this much work into it. But I think it's, it's you know, the reflexivity of it, you know, this piece where we we, we hold it lightly, we look at it, we like, does it need to change? How does it need to change? Where can we, where can we affect change? Um, what are the needs of the audiences that we're working with? Um, and one of the places that's been really sort of fun for me to look at in terms of a challenge, an important challenge that helps us sort of like um, reflect the needs of groups and whatnot is in our val evaluation process. Um, I think that evaluations are so uh, traditionally these like, you know, yes, no, score one to 10. Um, in a lot of our youth programming, we actually have like this um, person with like a big, like a, an idea. So like the head, heart, hand piece of evaluation and, and, and looking at like where youth feel that change from the programs that we do in terms of like, is it a values change? Is it a heart change? Is it a skill change? Um, and really sort of finding creative ways to Thanks, Delaney. I see ya. I'm coming up on my time. Um, really looking at creative ways to um, uh, shape our, change our evaluation so that they resonate more with the youth that we work with and they help impact our work as well. And then I just lastly wanted to uh, mention our work as a staff team. You know, we've, um, I just want to put this little slide up here from some some work that we did with a facilitator about a year ago, um, you know, that we when we're creating our programs, we really try to keep these sort of like this like flares of change here. Um, uh, forefront in our mind when we're thinking of what programs are like um, and working as a staff team in terms of brainstorming with each other, trying to take down those silos so that we can use each other's strengths. Um, yeah, so questions at the end. This is ACIC. Uh, thank you all so much. And I think Nancy's going next. So good, no, good luck. Uh, back to Delaney, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie. That's um, really wonderful. So hold on to your questions till the end, but uh, keep them in mind. Um, Okay, je vais maintenant parler français pour présenter notre prochaine panéliste. Uh, Nancy to present Burrows. our next uh, uh, Nancy, nous présentons Nancy Burrows. Je... She's coming from Quebec today. Where is she responsible for ACOSI? She's responsible for edge uh, for global citizenship education. She's been working for thirty years as a liaison agent for the World uh, Women's March up until 2006 at the OKC. She worked up until 2018. She's responsible for, for implementing an action plan to increase awareness and mobilization of the Quebec's populations with regard to international sour The Background for her engagement is involved with the international struggle against sexism and homophobia with an intersectional uh, feminist point of view. There you go, Nancy. Thank you. Can you hear me now? That's great. Thank you to everyone. I'll be uh, presenting the overall vision of 
global citizenship uh, developed by ACOC and its member. And I'll end the presentation with a very special project that's stimulating in GCE that we're using in Quebec at the present time. Here's my PowerPoint. I think you can see it. A C is it's like the other councils, but we have 70 member organizations. We have 70 member organizations. I'd just like to talk a little about uh, the history of our approach. You'll remember that with the other councils, we created the global hive, Ruche Mondiale, and, and we'll be able to make a, a PowerPoint presentation in English that I'm talking about, including global hive, that is full of tools. It's been implemented by ACOC and the different councils. I don't remember in which years, I think it was 2015 or 2016 that it was created. In ACOC, we had a first rendezvous on GCE in 2007. Members were working with public engagement, but we weren't talking about uh, GCE at that time until that meeting in 2017. GCA became a cross-cutting approach for ACOC after that. It's in our five-year strategic planning uh, starting in 2018. Even before 2017, we did a lot of uh, work on joint construction of the reference frame it exists in three languages, English, French, and Spanish on the website. And it, it tells us what uh, GC is for us. It was the, took uh, two years of, of meetings, committee meetings with uh, international organization uh, who worked with us. And finally, it was adopted in uh, 2019. I'll be presenting a short video now on the definition of uh, GCE, and I'll give you some examples. We have a wonderful challenge to show the video in French, and you can listen to the sound in English for the interpreters. So I'll say one, two, three, go. So Scott knows when, to, so the interpreter knows when to give us the sound in English. I think you see it here. Here at the Association Québécoise des Organismes de Coopération Internationale, ACOSI, we recognize that the world we live in is rife with economic, political, social, and environmental inequalities. Unequal power structures exist in our society, as well as between peoples and nations. We believe that we have a collective responsibility to make change in order to create a more just and equitable world. This is why ACOSI adopted a common definition of global citizenship education during its 2019 General Assembly. Global Citizenship Education, GCE, is a response to the urgent need for action on local and global issues. It is based on a recognition of the self-determination and interdependence of people and their interaction with all living beings, individual and collective commitments to the promotion of women's rights, human rights, and the environment, and the affirmation that we are all responsible for the world. GCE allows us to understand the structural causes of power dynamics that create injustice and inequality. A true call to action, GCE is a set of practices that promote solidarity, learning, awareness building, and concrete positive social transformation. It prioritizes an active and reciprocal approach with individuals and communities for the purpose of co-constructing soft skills and the power to act. Action in GCE is oriented around five major pillars. 
Awareness building. To inform the public of the many different elements involved in international solidarity. Training. To reinforce skills and understand power dynamics and inequality, both at a local level and internationally. Research. To enrich or develop new understandings in a spirit of collaboration with individuals and groups. Mobilizing to bring people together in a collective movement that values community and learning through action. Advocacy, to put pressure on public and political processes and propose alternatives that increase our political impact. Working in partnership with other groups, international cooperation organizations create real change in the world. This is what GCE is all about. Workshops, conferences, activities in schools, marches, kiosks, mentoring, public events, popular education circles, public theater, action research, petitions, meetings with government representatives, and much more. Change happens because thousands of people get involved. For example, Elodie and other students organized with their friends and changed their school's curriculum to include international and environmental education. Manu participated in a Quebec Without Borders internship like thousands of young people before him. After his first-hand experience of international solidarity in Senegal, he decided to get involved with a group that supports people experiencing homelessness back home, allowing him to enact change at the local level. Marc Arthur gathered signatures for petitions and participated in marches, supporting a global campaign that successfully fought for debt relief for the poorest countries in the world. Aisha and other young people in her community created an anti-bullying application to teach high school students about inclusion. Following a variety of pressure tactics and awareness campaigns, David's organization succeeded in obtaining fair trade city status for their municipality. Following a conference by activists for women's rights, more and more Quebecers, like Rashida, can understand the injustices and impacts that Canadian mining companies have on women and Indigenous peoples. That's what GCE is all about. People organizing to create local change by developing bonds of solidarity and mutual aid. Each group and individual is free to adapt GCE to meet their needs. Through their engagement, their work building awareness, organizing and advocating, and by sharing their experiences, participants become agents of change helping to build a more egalitarian, just, equitable, inclusive, sustainable, mutually supportive, and peaceful world. GCE is a global initiative that develops and reinforces the skills, abilities, and engagement of individuals and collectives alike. These three transformative pillars lead to personal changes in our lifestyle, actions, and behaviors, changes in our relationships with others and the planet, and systemic changes in our policies and our environmental and social economic structures. GCE helps reinforce the development of more just and equitable relationships built on reciprocity and interdependence between individuals and peoples. To really see what GCE is all about, we have to look at the work on the ground. Thanks to the tireless efforts of thousands of people involved with international solidarity and cooperation organizations, we get closer every day to a more just and egalitarian world where human rights are respected. GCE serves as a blueprint for action and as a common frame of reference within which we can work together towards a better world, here and everywhere. If you want to learn more, information about GCE is available on ECOSI's website in French, Spanish, and English at www.ecosi.qc.ca slash ECM. Gives you a little idea of what UC is according to ACUSI and its members. And I'll just continue. Let me, excuse me, let me go back to my PowerPoint now. And I just wanted to, if you want to know more about the five major streams of 
uh, GCL. We have all of that in English and French on our website. We talk about why, for whom, what, etc. So I just wanted to uh, talk about some highlights of our survey for members to see what their GCE practices were. And if with the uh, population of people who are targeted by GCA, the general population, it, the, most of our work is that, and then for, the, followed by youth 18 to 35, and then we, uh, 63% also were school-aged children. In some cases, it was just for adults and other target populations for activities for women or indigenous populations and the places where these activities take place. This uh, concept of GC is, is devoted to what we do in the schools. It, it includes educational activities and formal, uh, informal, and non formal, informal spaces, their activities in, in teaching institutions and, and other kinds of training centers. But in extra, the extracurricular environment, we have popular education, extra curricular environment and unions and community organizations. And there are things that take place in non-structured spaces, festivals, parks, uh, outside activities and daily life in the workplace, in uh, leisure and sports. Those are the times of activities. Those are the kinds of activities, youth activities, producing materials, webinars, webinars. Uh, and I'm coming to the end of the time. And very quickly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a, a project that we launched this year. It's, it's called the uh, Collective for Citizens. There's a new uh, mandatory course that will be implemented in 2,795 elementary and secondary schools in Quebec starting in 2024. They'll be taking this course for 10 years, and it's a course that will go from 6 to 17 years of age, and it's called Culture and Quebec uh, Citizenship. It's based on dial and critical thinking. With this, the arrival of this new course, oops, there's something that didn't work here in the visual. I was supposed to, uh, it can give you an date of some of the themes that we have addressed, identity, relation to self, the planet, sex education, relation to Jim, Jim, no, information, political and social organization, religion, worldviews, collective life, equality, and social inclusion, social engagement, rights and freedoms, power, social inequalities, environment, and ecological transition. These are certain uh, subjects that will be uh, dealt with during these courses and will be offered to young people. There is a critical need for educational material. The Ministry of Education has created the program, but it doesn't create the material as such. So our initiative in it is to have a, a coordinating initiative, initiative with other groups, a feminist group for an indigenous group, and we're going to uh, work on a collection of materials for the teachers through joint construction on all you've seen the uh, logos of the environmental groups and the others who are members of this collective and will be working with teachers and uh, educational counselors and I'll be finishing and it's the idea of uh, working jointly on these materials for these courses with the 
tools of popular education, uh, et cetera, that will provide the teachers with materials for in the GCE perspective. And I can answer your questions if you'd like. Thank you very much, Nancy. But uh, today we have um, James Cornelson. Uh, he's joining us from Manitoba Council for International Cooperation in Winnipeg, uh, along with uh, Aline, um, who will be kind of uh, talking more about some of the creative work that MCIC has been doing with youth. Um, but James has worked in the field of international development and humanitarian assistance for 18 years. So as a teacher by profession, James served as a community development worker with Mennonite Central Committee in Mozambique, and later went on uh, to work as a public engagement coordinator for Canadian Food Grains Bank. Um, so James' experience in public engagement includes leading numerous uh, learning tours on global food security to countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Central America, and the Middle East. Uh, and he has developed educational activities for Canadians to learn about global issues and given leadership to learning and advocacy campaigns, encouraging Canada to do more on international aid and development assistance. So thank you very much for being here, James and Alin, and uh, you can go right ahead. Thanks so much, Delaney, and thanks to the other presenters. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, joining you from Treaty 1 territory, the ancestral lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene nations, and also the national homeland of the Red River Metis. Um, I'm going to speak, I'm um, going to talk to you today a little bit about arts based engagement and specifically spoken word. So it's a bit more specific. I want to say up front that what I'm sharing is really the work of our Inspire team, partners, participants, um, and MCIC has been doing programming with schools in Manitoba for many years. So I want to give a quick overview of our, some of our schools programming and then focus more specifically on our spoken word project called Voices for Change. So in terms of our engagement work, looking at more awareness building, our work with the Insight 360 degree cylinder this last three months, uh, actually uh, January, February, March, uh, was mainly about raising awareness and showing global stories uh, for students and youth on global issues and sustainable development. Just a few numbers there for you to show you the wider um, kind of engagement. And also book lists. We do reading challenges and book lists. And so these are sent out to school libraries and librarians are invited to put up displays during International Development Week. And this is another example of sort of building awareness and they love the classroom pizza parties, by the way. Uh, our classroom workshops take the approach of engaging directly with students and educators using an experiential approach, which goes deeper into topics related to the, to the SDGs. Uh, so those are very hands-on. And uh, we have a variety of workshops that we deliver, uh, both directly to students uh, inside classrooms by request, but also we do um, we model them for teachers in professional development sessions. And so we work very closely with teachers across Manitoba. And speaking of which, um, you know, we really appreciate building relationships. I think that's something Jackie mentioned and um, uh, is very important to the way we do the public engagement work. We recognize teachers as strategic partners. So amplifying their own voices and their role in encouraging global citizenship amongst Manitoba students and youth. So a big focus of our programming is to give students a voice um, to um, recognize that voice either by creating contests or recognizing their achievements. These are students who submitted take action projects and then that's an activity directly linked with a unique Manitoba curriculum course for grade 12 called Global, uh, Global Issues uh, that MCIC actually helped to shape. So it sounded very similar to some of the things Nancy was talking about. Um, so now I wanted to focus just a little bit more on Voices for Change. This is, um, uh, we've been doing spoken words since 2014 to present during IDW. In, in 2018, we changed the name to Voices for Change uh, to more reflect what's actually happening. And this reflects the, the goals of the program. So we've worked with anywhere from one to six youth participants at a, at a time, and we get applicants from Manitoba high schools. 
This year, we had the amazing fortune to have Eileen Kohan, a grade 11 student in Winnipeg, apply for our Voices for Change project. And she's joining us with, I'll, I'll ask her to speak in a minute, but just want to talk a little bit about the program first. Um, so she applied and Eileen brought a unique set of theater and poetry skills to the project, along with some amazing lived experience, being a relatively recent immigrant from Iran and coming from that country, witnessing what has been happening there, but also adapting to living in Canada and mixing that with all the challenges of being a young person, identity, purpose, vocation, and so on. And all this, um, Eileen was able to put eloquently into her poem called Someday. Um, and I will drop the link to the YouTube video a little later, or I think it's being dropped uh, into, the, into the chat at some point. So, and then of course um, it's performed and perform it, she has definitely done. She's performed it on radio, on Zoom, in person and at a few different events to about 400 different people uh, at, at a few different events. So including the International Development Week event at the Manitoba Legislature last February, lots of elected officials in the mix here with other partners and, and um, staff and whatnot from, from uh, MCIC's circle and, and network. So Eileen continues to receive requests to perform. Um, her video has been viewed about 18, 1800 times and she's, uh, it's a bit long to share in this short presentation, but again, I'll share the link so you can check it out. Um, please share if you feel led. Um, she also featured on CBC's local radio program, Up to Speed. And coincidentally, this radio feature was uh, facilitated because somebody reached out from the CBC once they saw it uh, by a CBC staffer who happened to be a past participant of our Voices for Change project a few years ago. So that was, um, that was a pretty cool connection. And the IDW, uh, International Development Week performance, was also featured in other media. For example, the Winnipeg Free Press, which is our local newspaper here in Winnipeg. So some of the key aspects of spoken word or slam poetry, um, which is called as a tool for global citizenship. Um, some of these aspects are number one, youth. You need youth with skills and interest in theater along with their passion, knowledge and lived experience. Um, number two, this is arts-based engagement, something that engages a person through their creativity, intuition and imagination. Uh, and these are the things that actually move us. And when we say move us, they create change. So empathy, not surprisingly, is also associated with that same part of the brain. So logic and science, of course, they form the basis of what we do, but we are really moved as human beings through the creative, imaginative and intuitive parts of our brains. And it's kind of the why and the how of social change. I uh, want to talk a little bit about a third thing, which is development expertise. So we work with a consultant named Steve Locke. He is an MCI, he, he's been an MCIC partner uh, for many years, uh, helped us introduce slam poetry. He calls it slam poetry, we call it spoken word. He has experience, a, a lot of experience working in the Manitoba school context, so with youth. So he's also deeply committed to youth development. And according to Steve, I had a nice interview with him the other day. Slam has a big impact because it has calls to action embedded in the genre and it's performed live. So there's an immediate emotional connection with an audience and it puts the artist as an instrument for social change. Steve creates the environment for creativity. And, you know, it has some risk and vulnerability to it, but the approach he takes is also to bring his own vulnerability. He inspires confidence in participants through the development sessions and is it's by nature a participatory a participatory process so uh, production and promotion is of course one i can't say enough about the skills of our team members who bring the art to life through video medium and using various platforms to connect with all kinds of audiences but I should note the emphasis is on the live performances, whether it's virtual or an in-person. So those live experiences are really important. A little bit of the background of the making of, and uh, Eileen, I'm not sure if you saw that or not, but um, this is just one of the ways we just promoted it. Um, I'll, I'm gonna end with a quote from a participant of a live online event featuring Someday, the poem, 
Uh, this is also a young Iranian woman, an immigrant who happens to be from Alberta and who is active in organizing within the Iranian community there and beyond, and who actually attended one of the online events. Um, and I quote, Eileen's words were like a review of all the emotions I experienced as an Iranian woman and as an immigrant. The pain that we went through over the years and grew up with and could never have been spoken of because of Iran's dictatorship regime was being said aloud by Eileen. Her poem was a reminder for me that not a single Iranian woman could experience a normal life, whether, whether they lived inside Iran or not, although being in Iran is much worse. Uh, this photo I wanted to include because it was taken at the annual Yalda night with the Iranian community of Manitoba, where she also performed it live. And I'm extremely excited. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say again, another shout out to our team who worked together to bring about this type of programming. Uh, proud to share about their work as, as for me, someone who pulls like reports together and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I just want to give Eileen a chance. Like I, at first it was, I was interviewing her the other day saying, hey, how, tell me a bit more about this project, its impact on you. And she said, she volunteered quickly to come and be a part of this webinar. So I wanted to give Eileen a couple of minutes to just share a, a little bit about it. So Eileen, if you can unmute uh, and um, just talk a little bit about, I'll just give you quick three quick questions. The first one is how and why did you first get involved in Voices for Change? Um, well, first off, thank you so much for everything. Like being here is pretty oh, cool. I'm like I sure we always can love- Can folks hear her? Um, how about now? Can you hear it or? Yeah, we can hear it. I don't okay. think we got a chance to test okay. audio. Okay. Well, first off, thank you so much for um, letting me be a part of this again. Eileen, I'm sorry. I I can't hear you. I'm not sure if others can. James, I think you're maybe just on a channel or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But everyone else. Sorry, I mean, you can Eileen. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so how and I heard about this. Well, like, I believe it was through a school thing. Like my art teacher, she always um, puts out on like the school website about opportunities like this that come up. So I saw it and I had always been really passionate about poetry and I had, as an Iranian, always, you know, been involved in human rights and I had always wanted to help somehow. And when I heard about it, I thought that this was like a perfect chance because it was like art, but also human rights. And, and I didn't know that it was gonna be like this big. I thought it was just gonna be a small thing, but like hearing that it was gonna be on YouTube and everything, it was great. So yeah, like I was just really happy to be a part of it. So, um, and tell me a bit more, how has this project had an impact on your understanding of what it means to be a global citizen? Um, I'd say that it definitely made me think about it a lot more again, because before I had moved, it was something that, as you mentioned, it's like, as an Iranian girl or woman, it's something that you're faced with on a daily basis. And, you know, when I moved here, obviously, like, I still thought about it, but it's like, I got to think about it again. And I got to think about how it's still there, even though, like, so, in some places, it might, you know, discrimination against women might be shown differently, or like it might be more subtle versus let's say how it is in Iran. But, you know, being a part of this project, I got to um, like research a bit more about some of the other people's projects. Like I watched them on YouTube and I saw all these different topics. Like I focus more on like women's rights, but I saw that there was, for example, global warming and all of these things. And it really made me think about it a lot more and be more aware of it. Uh, that's awesome. How, so more generally, how has the project um, moved you or changed you? Um, I had always wanted to somehow share my experiences, like to in like to someone who isn't necessarily in my close group of friends or isn't my family, and just like being able to actually um, put in all these things that I've experienced and felt in the past couple of years in a poem, it just 
it made me it made all the more all these experiences more concrete like because you know when time passes passes things become memories so you don't really you aren't really aware of all the things that happened to you but just like writing it down like that and then performing it made me realize that it's always going to be a part of my life so that's great um <laughs> we got about a minute left Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had anything else you wanted to add before you have to go back to class. I know you, <laughs> you're probably skipping class to be here. And uh... that's okay. My teacher's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, honestly, I'd say that like I think art has always been a part of you know being able to bring about change in the world, like whether that's like music or poetry or paintings or just going to art galleries. And I feel like it's always gonna be a part of that because things like what's happening in Iran is they're always gonna be relevant. So like, as long as things are happening, poetry is gonna happen as well. So yeah, that's what I would say. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to connect. And um, I'm going to have to turn it. I'm sorry we're out of time. And I'm not sure if Eileen will be able to be around for question time. But I'm really thankful to you for joining us, Eileen, today. And back to you, Thank Delaney. You. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, James. And thanks very much, Eileen, for a special guest spot. Um, really kind of helps to, to bring forward what it is that um, the, the work that MCIC is doing. So wonderful to be able to get that first person account. So thank you very much for taking the time out of your day. Um, so, maintenant, I, enfin, et surtout, nous sommes rejoints par uh, Waj Al Alibi. Uh, Waj Al Alibi uh, is pour... with us now. To uh, she will be the last panelist. Uh, I need to speak in French once in a while, but although she'll be speaking in English, she, she's responsible for GCE and inspiring action. She has a, a, an honorary BA and a master's in studies in the Middle East and diasporas and transnational experience from the University of Toronto. Before she joined the council, she did research in climate technologies and in the preservations and development of cultural heritage in Canada. She's an associate pro professor of lang of English second as the second language and she walks for the Lebanese Red Cross and different organizations in the Middle East. She continues to explore how cultural heritage can have an effect on international development in societies that are subjected to conflict. Thank you very much, Washit. And you can start. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much Delaney for the introductions and um, thank you for having me. Um, so I, uh, my name is Wejd, and I am currently the Global Citizenship Education Lead for a Inspiring Action Program, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, who we are as an organization, our approach to global citizenship education, and some of the programs that we have held and continue to implement uh, to promote global citizenship in Alberta. So the Alberta Council for Global Cooperation, or ACGC, is a network of over 40 Alberta-based member organizations and individuals focused on sustainable development and global citizenship. We aim to mobilize Albertans to become more active global citizens engaged in sustainable development and gender equality, especially through increasing awareness, uh, sharing knowledge, and strengthening connections to act on global issues. Our vision is that all people can fulfill their potential and prosper, become engaged citizens in peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, and thrive in a healthy, sustainable world. 
again, we aim to largely mobilize Albertans to become global, global citizens. And we do this by building the capacity of network organizations, representing members' interests with government and others, and increasing uh, the awareness, knowledge, and connections of Albertans um, in global issues. One of our primary, primary vehicles of global citizenship promotion and knowledge transmission is really education. At ACGC, we understand global citizenship education to be an ethos and a way in which to see and understand the world. It refers to a sense of belonging to the global community and common humanity with its presumed members experiencing solidarity and collective identity among themselves and collective responsibility to act at the global and the local level. ACGC's Learn, Share, Act model of global citizenship education is based on cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral domains of learning, with the idea being that when learning opportunities are designed and implemented with these three domains considered, outcomes and engagement will be stronger. We view global citizenship education to encompass the programs, conversations, resources, and guides that allow educators and youth to embody this concept of global citizenship. Two of our main youth programs targeting uh, youth aged 18 to 24 include our SDG Hub and our Global Connect program. The SDG Hub, which ended in its fifth and final year just in February, was designed with the aim of providing opportunities for young people in Alberta to fulfill the mandate of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Goals. The Hub was a space for young Albertan residents to meet and engage in a meaningful dialogue, to collaborate and take action in their communities on issues that they're passionate about. The youth also had a chance to develop personal and employment related skills, to learn from mentors, and to increase their awareness of the benefits of serving their communities. Over the past five years, we've seen 49 youth um, complete this program with us. A second major youth experiential learning program is Global Connect, which ACGC has been running since 2010, those previously called the Change Your World youth leadership program. In the past, youth traveled internationally to visit international development projects in places like Ethiopia and Peru, run collaboratively by our partner organizations. Beginning in 2019, with limits on international travel, we started taking a new approach. We started partnering with our members and other projects and initiatives to provide youth the opportunity to learn about international cooperation through dialogue and practical hands-on learning um, uh, via site visits to Alberta-based organizations working in the fields of international development. So over the summer and into the fall, Global Connect participants implement um, public engagement activities um, by opening up conversations around some of the lessons learned throughout the Global Connect experience. In addition to youth programs, ACGC is largely focusing on targeting children in K-12 to uh, and educators working with these groups. So these include resources and workshops. And the following three resources are the primary current ones offered by ACGC. Our Problem and Solution Trees resource was originally created in partnership with an Edmonton school in 2017 to 18. But in 2020 and 21, we redesigned the workshops and released in early 2022. And this consisted of various case studies on two change makers. And this resource models how to use a uh, problem and solution trees, which is a type of mind map used by international development organizations to think through the root causes of a community issue to take appropriate action and to evaluate the income, the out, the, excuse me, the impact. Another resource is our Beyond a Single Stories activity. Created between 2020 and 21, 
this was designed to allow grade seven to 12 students to explore the ways that intersecting identities can affect a person's reality and quality of life. By considering these diverse viewpoints within a community, students can really gain an understanding of the complexities of a certain community's challenges and strengths. Each case study was provided um, and uh, in the activity was created in partnership and solidarity with an international cooperation organizations and its international partners. Uh, for example, we feature a case study developed with Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan and an India case study developed from the Alberta-based uh, organization COST. Our third major resource is one that James already sort of touched on, um, and it's called the Better World is in Sight project. And following the successful deployment of the uh, immersive Better World is in Sight dome across the prairies, ACGC repackaged the contents uh, and the workshops to be able to offer an opportunity for Alberta schools to continue to engage with the content in a new way. And this consisted of creating uh, immersive 3D cardboard glasses that could be connected to student phones where they could watch uh, videos on various international um, and global uh, uh, issues. When creating workshops in general, ACGC aims to design and package resources in a way that teachers can also access and use them themselves as well. In addition to physical resources and classroom workshops, um, ACGC uh, virtually holds an educator community of practice or an educator roundtable uh, once a month. And this started in the uh, spring, sorry, in the spring of 2020 with the onset of COVID-19, where ACGC began regular meetings of teachers to offer space for support and engagement. And the first year, this started as a spring book club, um, but the desire of, of teachers to stay connected meant that the following two years, um, we designed something different, um, particularly an educator community of practice. And from 2022 um, to 2023, we began calling this initiative a roundtable. And we really focused on connecting ACGC member organizations and their experiences with the educators. So the educators meet uh, six to seven times per school year from October to June, and they discuss topics such as deliberative dialogue in classrooms um, and terror management in students. ACGC has also a yearly presence at uh, multiple teachers conventions across the province where workshops are held to teach educators how to use um, these various tools and resources. And that is um, what we have for you today. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you so much again for listening. Wonderful, merci beaucoup, Awesh. Um, so we will be moving on to the questions portion of this webinar. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat there and we will pull them up. We'll grab all of our, our panelists together. Um, so you can take a moment to, to put in any questions that you may have. Um, what I may just start us off with, um, if we have everyone here, is I'm interested to know how you found that for this kind of work in, in education and in connecting with youth um, particularly, um, have you found that the COVID-19 pandemic and the transition to working remotely, how did that affect what you were doing and, and the kind of work that you were able to do? And do you find that there are things that you've learned from that period of time um, that you're going to be taking forward? Or, or maybe you're just feeling um, happy to be uh, able to go back to um, more kind of in-person work as we um, move forward out of the emergency phase of the pandemic, but I'd be interested to know if you have any kind of thoughts on, on how that affected what you're actually able to do. So that's more of a, an open question if we have anyone who wants to pipe up. Yeah, Nancy. I can answer not necessarily with regard to young people. We do, it's our members who work directly with young people. But I was thinking about other education 
activities that we've done, our training, I'm thinking of the feminist school that we organize. And the fact that we do it virtually has allowed our Southern partners to take part in our GC activities and it wasn't possible in the uh, in the past. It's a positive effect of the pandemic or of virtual work. It's to be able to have dialogues and discussions and joint construction project, not only with people here, but also with partners in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. That's one of the um, positive things that we saw. have other answers for that question I'd be happy to, to talk about that but we also have a question in the chat if we would like to move on um so for uh wish uh how many teachers do you have um in your roundtable meetings do you have an ACGC staff member attend or facilitate those meetings or is it more for the teachers to work together and that's a question coming from Amanda Benson thank you Amanda hello Amanda thank you for your question um, we currently have about 40 teachers across the province registered for our roundtables. Um, on average, we get between 10 and 20, so sometimes it's a smaller group, um, but sometimes we, we do get about um, 20 teachers sitting in. And our facilitator for those conversations um, is Bill Howe. He is an educator and has been um, involved uh, sort of in the field of global citizenship education for a while now. Um, but in addition to um, Bill facilitating the sessions, we also usually invite guests. So last month we had Dr. Catherine Van Kessel, um, who is currently, she was at the University of Alberta, currently in Texas, and does a lot of work on terror management theory in, uh, in students. Um, so we often start off our, uh, our sessions with a presentation from sort of an, an expert. Um, and then we, uh, we, Bill facilitates sort of the discussion around that. Great. Um, all right. We're not seeing uh, any further questions in the chat so far. So please uh, type quickly if you've got one. <laughs> um, okay, wonderful. And we've, we've got an answer there from Amanda. So that I think we answered the question. Um, perfect. So um, maybe just for now, I'll continue to, to ask my own questions. Um, but I was wondering about um, in terms of um, global citizenship education, is there a way that you, uh, and I, I would say this is a, an open question as well, whoever wants to kind of jump in. Um, there's some obviously conversation around paternalism or white saviorism when you talk about international development in a general kind of way. Um, is Are there ways that you can kind of point to in your organizations that you are trying to be aware of that and, and be aware of um, how to be um, incorporating um, international development and global uh, citizenship education in a in a mindful way um, as you kind of go forward with your community your various communities that you're you're trying to connect with or what those kind of strategies look like to, to kind of ensure an ethical um, way of operating um sorry you've met the additional uh, ACIC coworker here, Millie, who mm -hmm. often attends our staff meetings. Um, <laughs> I would just say, I know in terms of youth programming that we do at ACIC, we've been kind of intentional to, oh, and this might be like a, I don't know if it's okay to say out loud or not, but like when we talk about structures with youth, we make sure that we talk about structures at all levels, right? So when we're looking at the SDGs, we talk about the UN, right? And what are some like highs and lows, pros and cons of the UN? What are some highs, lows, pros, cons, all of those things of like, like systems in terms of nonprofits, in terms of inst academic institutions. Um, so I think we really try to have those conversations um, with youth because every system should be looked at in a in a like a larger scale and and seeing like um, the good and the not so great that can come from them. Um, and I would also say. Um, in terms of our global citizenship certificate, our conference that we do with youth, we always, you know, like our three knowledge modules are on the SDGs, um, intersectionality and anti-oppression and indigenous realities, you know, like we, I think we really sort of tackle it a little bit by ensuring that we're looking at the local pieces that impact us right here most directly mm -hmm. and then going 
then making those connections global. Um, and in addition, I would say another piece is offering sort of like caucusing spaces or um, identity sort of safe spaces. So in terms of um, our photo, our most recent photo voice was um, for, it was a all women's program for female two-spirit identified folks, right? Female identified two-spirit folks. Um, and those conversations were really different than conversations that had happened in the other, other photo voice programs. So um, at the programming level, I think um, in terms of the spaces we provide and the conversations that we prompt a bit. Wonderful. So we do have a question in the chat um, coming from Bill Howe. Um, so this is for James. Uh, is there a plan for uh, Eileen or other performers to publish their poems as a collection? I would love to have a copy of their poems to use in the classroom, especially contextualized within the issues they address which is a very uh, exciting kind of question, I'm sure for you, James. Yeah, actually we have collected them sort of on our website as spoken word sort of video productions. Um, I don't think we have a, a written down somewhere or collected them in that way, uh, but that's a great idea. We could certainly look at doing that. Uh, we have sort of, you know, encouraged, you know, submit this to a poetry contest and things like that. Um, but I'm happy to discuss that with my team, for sure. Wonderful. And yeah, we might come out of this with a, a new publication on our hands. All right, so we have another question for, for Jackie. So um, coming in from Amanda, um, how did you select your youth advisory committee? Were they appointed by ACIC or did the youth have to apply? Great question. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so they actually had to apply. Um, and it was like, we try to do as many sort of zero, zero barriers program, like about application stuff as we could do as we can. So we didn't go with like a, a reference type um, application process. It was basically interest, like, you know, some simple questions about their interest. Um, and we had eight youth, two from each province, so that we had that regional representation. And in addition, we broke the ages up a little bit so that we had four youth who were the 15 to 18 age group and then four youth who were the older so that we could have that sharing of experiences. And when it came to the selection process, we actually had um, a, a youth staff, like a, a student who was working with us at the time, and also a past youth sit on the selection committee with us um, so that we could look at the selection. And then, yeah, we kind of like, as always, kind of uh, we're trying to move more and more away from matrixes as they're quite colonial in their their structure um, and trying to find creative ways of looking at um, how to select youth rather than just matrix um, and found that the youth voices who were on the selection committee really helped and we had a great like they were just a wonderful set of youth advisors who are I think six of the eight are still very actively connected to us now so yeah thanks Amanda wonderful um, all right, so we will be wrapping up our questions shortly. Um, I don't know if we've got any last minute ones in the in the chat here. Um, we do have a, a question from our own Judy Annette, um, but she was, I was just uh, wondering, what uh, has been your experience connecting the global and the local in your global citizenship education, which is kind of what we talked about in terms of um, how we were uh, going about things ethically, but I would love to hear maybe more um, from, from uh, uh, Wajd or, or, um, or from Nancy, um, peut-être en français, Nancy, uh, à propos de comment est-ce qu'on peut uh, connecter le uh, local et puis uh, international. Um, but for either of you, it's an open question. I can jump in. Um, so I think we we've found that um, it is difficult sometimes for for youth here to feel that global issues are relevant to them because it's just it's it seems very far away and they they feel far removed. Um, so I think when designing youth programs, for example, um, in our Global Connect program, we actually aim to have that exchange where an international youth comes to us and participates in our programs. Um, and in that way sort of um, provides that perspective in Alberta, for example, um, where many youth um, have not had the opportunity to travel um, internationally or experience these problems that other parts of the world face. Um, but also I think 
just being intentional with who who you're targeting for the programs is really important. So ensuring that um, newcomer uh, communities are being uh, you know informed that first of all these programs exist um, and that we want them to participate. Um, I think those are a couple of strategies that we've that we've tried to use to to connect that local and global uh, perspective. Great, wonderful. And then I don't know if Nancy, you had a, a remark before we wrap up. Uh, it depends if it's global. It depends if it's globally or with youth. Often they are individual exchanges, I mean, amongst adults and our youth, the meeting of people personally from different parts of the planet, that would be from people here, here or from elsewhere, has an impact on us. And also that when we do analysis on the power relationship, uh, or we do global analysis to really establish a link of what happens here, or what happens elsewhere, so going back to the pan pandemic time, uh, that was a, an, an opportunity to really show that we are all interrelated and all our systems are interrelated. We are interdependent as peoples that uh, live in this uh, planet. And when I talk about well, all the ec ecological um, and climatic issues are uh, a concern for youth. And so, uh, and we can, make a relationship that we can do that is not uh, uh, not us and as a community, but that we have to go out to the global also from the local to the global. The world beyond you is very much going to affect your your life on a micro level. It's um, definitely kind of came to came to light for a lot of folks in a in a more real way than we might be used to. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup à tous. Um, I'm going to pass it along to Judy Annette back to um, wrap us all up here. Um, but I do want to just say before we wrap up, thank you so much um, to our panelists, um, as well as Eileen, who's had to, to head out, but um, wonderful to have her come in here and, and chat with us today. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I'll, I'll pass it along to you, Judy Annette. Thank you so much, Delaney. Uh, and thank you, everyone. That was really nice. I was um, I was taking notes, so it, it's always good to uh, learn from everyone. Thanks for taking the time to attend and join us. And um, if you want to learn more about the topic that we just talked about, you can check out the council's website or the ICN website and um, sign up for our newsletter and all that. Uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll have other events that we are hosting uh, throughout the year related to this and public engagement. So you're always welcome to attend and uh, let us know what you think. And I just wanted to thank the, the panelists for all your insights. It's really nice to uh, hear about all your work. So that was really good. I, and obviously Delaney, thank you for moderating the conversation and doing such a great job. And Matteo, who is not here he's in the background but making sure things are running smoothly so thank you so much for that um yeah and i hope you um oh okay yes there are other there are other four councils that we didn't hear about their work yes we'll be hosting another uh webinar like this in the fall to highlight the other councils work so keep an eye out for that and uh we'll we'll let you know once that um, that's planned. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, 
Okay.